way they position the building on Wabasha Hill above the city, you know, it has a little prominence. The stonework, uh, the artwork, it's pretty much irreplaceable. You know, there isn't the people around today do everything the way we had originally. Everyone knows Minnesota's capital is regarded as one of the, the best architectural capitals in the country. And um, it really, that marble, it would have been a difficult choice to, to go with any other stone than the Georgian white marble. When this building opened in 1905, people came by the thousands just to see the electric lights and to see the artwork and to see the beautiful architecture because this really was kind of that step forward for Minnesota to say we've arrived as a state. We have the culture. Out east, people are always looking down on the Midwest as kind of backwoods, you know, not much going on there. But when people saw photographs or came out here to St. Paul to visit the Capitol, they were really impressed. This was something you would see in Washington, D.C. or New York or Philadelphia or Boston. Key things that uh, helped facilitate uh, moving forward capital restoration was the creation of the Preservation Commission, and that that law was passed in in 2011 with uh, bipartisan support. Uh, it had uh, both Republican and Democratic uh, authors, uh, both in the House and Senate, and um, the commission itself is made up of the top leadership of state government, both uh, majority and minority members uh, from the House and Senate, as well as the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, chief, chief justice, uh, as well as public members. I have a chunk of marble in my office that literally fell down from somewhere off the side of the building and landed about five feet in front of me where I was walking. 2009 is when we uh, had uh, discovered that we had exterior stone that was at risk of falling and that's when we had to put up uh, scaffolding uh, from a life safety standpoint, some protective barriers. And that really um, uh, started the, the ball rolling on getting the right attention on, on fixing and restoring the, the state capitol building. Put in quite a bit to restore the ceiling up on the third floor. And then um, just this past spring, water began to seep through it. And uh, it wasn't coming in from the outside. It was uh, coming in uh, from uh, condensation from one of the air handling units. The capitol is out of code so badly that one of the reasons why we have that it has to have a renovation is for life and safety things. Well, you had uh, significant water damage, and, and you've seen that if on the inner dome. Uh, if you look up, you can see significant damage to the lunettes, um, uh, the decorative uh, work that's up on the inner dome, and just uh, all around the the twelve windows, uh, the large twelve windows in the dome, significant uh, plaster damage. Uh, uh, and just uh, a lot of deterioration that was happening. Certainly they didn't uh, make any accommodations for disabled people, even though in 1905 there were an awful lot of them, um, especially war veterans uh, coming home from the Civil War who were still around in, in 1905 in great numbers, uh, and even some of those that were more recently back from the Spanish-American War. The thing you have going on with the exterior is the decorative elements on on um, this capital are, uh, uh, there's about 50,000 plus pieces of individual stone on the capital and many of, you, many of those have uh, some type of ornamental decoration on it and, and so it's those decorative pieces that see the most significant uh, wear and tear over time. Well the, uh, the marble on the capital is um, a lot of people who come to our display at the State Fair uh, in the past two years have looked at it and said, how come, how come I, I've been to the Vatican? You know, that, that was put up 500 years ago. Uh, how come that marble looks good and this looks so terrible? And the reason is, is our climate. Uh, marble is very porous. It allows water to seep into it. If anybody has a regular marble as opposed to a granite countertop, you've, you've seen this happen. Well, it freezes and thaws and flakes off. And so what you have is the capital literally dissolving. One or two tablets of Alka-Seltzer become an alkalizing liquid your body uses easily, quickly, naturally. And uh, it's being scraped down and sanded down and a lot of the parts of the building are, are being uh, completely removed and replaced with freshly carved pieces. 
He also discovered that in the process of carving the capital 105 years ago, they were using a uh, air, hand, uh, air chisel system uh, back then that was kind of primitive. And it was such a violent motion that they, when they were, were, were uh, carving the, the stone that it actually introduced little micro fissures into the, into the rock itself. Well, here you can see where they're replacing some of the most deteriorated portions and decorative portions of the capital with uh, freshly carved pieces. Uh, they found two locations to get these pieces carved, by the way. One was in Toronto, Canada. The other was in uh, Italy. As it turns out, Italy is actually the cheaper source than Canada, partially because there's so many folks who do that type of work over there that there actually is a competitive market for uh, stone carving. Who would, have, who would have thought? Over the past, previous 20 years, something like 80% of all the money put into this building was basically done on an emergency basis or a repair basis. There has been really very little money put into the building over the years for actually you know, renovation and bringing the bill up. It was always basically something's gone wrong. We've had, they've had to fix something. There's about two thirds of the building under construction. So it's, those are two thirds of the building is, is in a construction zone and not open to the public. Um, so really you're gonna have uh, the house and Senate chambers uh, and you're gonna have three committee hearing rooms. Other than that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the tenants have already been relocated out of the building and uh, there's going to be construction work going on. Obviously, we're going to, uh, safety is a priority uh, for everyone, uh, both in the construction zones and in the public spaces. So we will, uh, it's going to be historic from the standpoint that it's going to be unlike any other legislative session that there's, there's ever been. I think it's a good idea as we get towards the beginning of the session to Come visit senators by yourself and take a look around and kind of get a, a feel for the place. What you think you might have known about the Capitol prior to uh, construction or maybe from the 2014 session has completely changed. It's, uh, uh, you won't recognize the place anymore. So the House is not really affected and the day-to-day -day things as the uh, Senate has been. And also the Senate Minority Caucus is also not affected. Their offices are still intact. It's the majority of offices in this building that are being affected by it. In 2015, uh, it's going to be very cozy. Most of the building is shut off. Um, the rotunda is closed. The entire east wing is closed. It's going to affect uh, lobbyists and the public coming because there's going to only be a small area out in front. I give you an example is, you know, many members are called off the floor by constituents and by, you know, or by uh, people concerned with an issue. And, you know, they had many areas where they could just kind of go off and talk. Now there's only going to be a small area in front of the chambers. We're down to just three hearing rooms, uh, room 15, 107, and 112. And uh, that's it. Uh, in order to make it work, uh, we're going to probably uh, uh, run those, run more hearings in each room, basically, and go later into the day than we had to. That's not finalized yet. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how to organize the committees to, to, to get it to work. We will have television up. It actually will be new digital television uh, that uh, will be going. So uh, if uh, it's acceptable to watch TV, we, uh, we, we will be televised. But the House will be losing its caucus rooms. Uh, so that's going to be, as uh, far as uh, the House being able to meet in caucus, I'm, uh, I don't know how they're going to comment. I may presume they're going to do it in the state office building. Also, the House at that has one hearing room in this building, and that's room 118. And again, that's in the east wing, and that has been taken over for uh, um, uh, renovation. So that's where the rules come in again. Again, that's going to impact it. The, right at the moment, the entire basement is closed off. You can't take the tunnel between the state office building and the Capitol. Knock on wood, that will be reopened in time for uh, 2015 session. Uh, for as far as demonstrations out in the front of the House chamber, like we've seen over the past several years, I, it's going to be, uh, that's going to have to be limited. Uh, and yes, I'd be, and, and we're going to be crowded. We're not going to have the rotunda where people are going to, and I don't know, what, I don't know if there's going to be a snack bar. Uh, there's all these things that are going to change that are going to affect people. There literally is no space inside the Capitol outside of the lobby, <laughs> if you're a lobbyist. <laughs> uh, but in terms of uh, space, there, it's so tight in the Capitol that there's not even a private conference room anywhere in the building. 
something else to keep in mind if you have a day on the hill. If, if you bring folks here, there's nowhere for them to be outside of a senator's office, and uh, they only have about two or three chairs in each one, so. After the 2015 session, basically the building will be, uh, will be evacuated. The, the sent, the, uh, both the north wing, which we're, and the uh, rest of the um, uh, west wing will be underneath construction uh, for that time. Wow. Here's the space for the lobbyists. Yeah. Here's the House Minority Caucus room. Hmm. Here's room 15, huh? Yeah. The, uh, they had to bring in uh, all the uh, piping and all the, all the duct work that has to go underneath the floor in the basement. Uh, that is an ongoing, that's going to take, from, from my understand, from 2013 till the end of the project, beginning uh, at the end of 2016. Senate Media Services. The new Government Relations Council space is right here in the basement. Enjoy. Enjoy. So here's Senate Research. Uh, we'll have restrooms uh, available. They're going to be greatly reduced in quantity, and we'll, under the Port Kershire to the south, we're actually going to have uh, temporary restroom units that are outside. One will be ADA accessible. Um, they will be heated. Where are these from, the, the stands? Well, a lot of them are just the, the fancy bronze-colored bases are from just everywhere in the Capitol corridor. Those, uh... Third floor. These are the office suites that Metzen and Metzen's office. Metzen's office, Clausen's office. Down the hall is Thomasoni's office. Wing to the house is closed off. The North Star is covered with plywood. The floors are covered with. Some Masonite. kind of protective masonite. Uh, woman's bathroom is over there. Yeah. The, f the steps are covered with, again, some kind of protective surface. The Supreme Court chamber is... Are they doing anything with that or not? Yeah. Heading towards the governor's office. This would be the attorney general suites over here. Yeah. On the right. A lot of, uh... Wow. Yeah, reception area. This is the Attorney General's office. Governor's reception room. Yeah. Wow. Where are those? The governor's office. And this is the governor's like study here. He tends to operate out here, doesn't he? No, no. This is right there. That was a very It's going to be unlike any other legislative session that there's there's ever been um, in in the building, and it's going to require everybody's uh, patience and, and flexibility um, going through the legislative session. The Senate uh, has been the major tenant in the Capitol since anyone can remember uh, in living memory, and uh, we're losing 38,000 square feet in the Capitol. And uh, giving a sense of how much space that is, it's, uh, it's, that's 80% the size of a football field.
that's the office space and storage space and uh, uh, whatnot that the Senate formally controlled in the Capitol is going to be uh, lost. Most of that is going to uh, convert to uh, public gathering spaces. There's been a number of studies that tied capital restoration to the need for additional space. And um, that's not unusual if you benchmark, if you look out to what other state capitals had to do when they uh, restored their state capitals. Wyoming's going through that right now. They're, they are uh, creating new legislative space because there wasn't enough space. Once you start to restore a state capital and add in uh, new mechanical systems, new life safety systems, all those systems take up space. And so we knew uh, that we were going to lose space just from the standpoint of adding, bringing up <clears throat> the capital to modern uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, life safety systems. But we also were aware that uh, we've had a number of hearings. Uh, Minnesotans like to participate in the legislative process, and there's just increased demand um, to participate in, in hearings. And so we certainly were looking for opportunities to how can we have larger hearing rooms uh, to help accommodate that, that interest uh, in participating in the legislative process. When the Capitol was built, it was, you know, they had the legislature here, House and the Senate, and they all had offices here, uh, as well as the governor. But uh, they didn't have uh, public hearings. Uh, they met in very small rooms, uh, just the committee members themselves. So you would see uh, an office door that would say uh, Senate Finance Committee. And uh, there was a, a table in there, rather small one. Um, if, uh, they're the type of Cass Gilbert tables that you still see in, uh, in, the, in a lot of the Senate offices. And the members would just sit there uh, uh, and decide bills. Uh, lobbyists could go in there uh, for the most part. The new building um, is going to have three large hearing rooms uh, that are located on the first floor. Um, that it'll play an important role during the 2016 session. It'll have the Senate chambers will also be uh, housed in, in the new building, along with uh, bringing the, uh, both the minority and majority parties uh, of the Senate into one building. So it, it's going to play a very important role um, in the legislative process uh, going forward. One thing that's a, a nice part of this project for the Minnesota Historical Society is we're actually going to go back to our original space in the Capitol's history. Um, when the building opened in 1905, the Minnesota Historical Society was housed in the ground floor east corridors. So the exhibits, the reading room, the library, all of the collection was housed there. And then of course we needed more space. We got to, to the point of needing a new building, so that's when the what is now presently the judicial building was built in 1918 and the Historical Society moved there. So that's kind of a neat part of this process to be coming back to some of that, that original Minnesota Historical Society space. So we'll have a, a large education center um, where it will serve as a, a conference committee room, but also a place where we can bring in thousands of kids to do all kinds of our public programming, our school programs, which you know delve into every theme of the capital, if it's art, architecture, Minnesota history, and even the government process. We do a lot of hands-on activities, so that allows us that opportunity opportunity to do that in that space. That was one of the most significant things we did in the early planning stages is, is to divide the capital up into zones and, and zone one spaces are those historic spaces uh, that the public is used to seeing that we we wanted to bring those back to the 1905 condition and that's from from the lighting to the decorative painting um, we want to bring back that architecture and that history uh, uh, to those, those areas. Other spaces, there are more the, the working areas of the building where there's offices, there's zone two, obviously we have a transition from zone one to zone two, um, all the way down to the mechanical spaces in, in zone four. So those are all treated differently uh, with different levels of, of um, treatment based on what zone it's in. So with the capital, obviously, a key thing to facilitate restoration is, is moving the uh, uh, existing uh, building tenants out of the building temporarily while restoration is happening. We were forced to move uh, a lot of offices out of the capital. Senate Council and Research has been moved over to the Centennial Building. Senate Majority Research, 
research is over there now. So is uh, uh, the Senate Fiscal Office, the Journal is over there, uh, uh, and Index is over there, and also our Human Resources offices. So we've moved a lot of offices from the Capitol into the uh, Centennial Office building up on the fifth floor. Those are open, you can certainly go visit there as well. And don't forget the Capitol Press Corps. We're over here in the Centennial Office building too. There are much more security measures being put in, but they are for obvious reasons, it's not a, things that we can elaborate on. With both the Capitol and the new building, you're trying to uh, balance uh, accessibility, access, uh, with putting in basic infrastructure needed to, to help facilitate public safety. So, it, And you try to do that in as discreet a way as possible, but you also want to put the infrastructure in place uh, to uh, support uh, the pu well, public Well, parking has always been bad around the Capitol, uh, the and that's not going to change. But the uh, uh, there are some ramps uh, nearby. Um, we're losing all the all of the lot B parking. Uh, that won't uh, affect uh, many visitors to the Capitol, but we should have, in a fairly short order, um, the new ramp uh, D, I believe it's called, on Rice Street should be close to completion or open by then. I have to actually double check on that. Sears, I believe, will still be available uh, in 2015. The uh, slots that are in at Bethesda Hospital and, and some of the other commercial lots are, will still be available. So the parking situation really won't change that much. It does for the senators and the staff. They've put up the temporary lot on, uh, on the front lawn of the Capitol, for example. And then going on down the road, all, cap all parking by the Capitol is going to disappear. It's going to be landscaped instead. There will be no parking in front of the Capitol for senators anymore. And uh, all that parking is going to go away, and it's, it's going to look much nicer if you take a picture of the Capitol and you don't have somebody's rusty old truck out front. It, it's going to uh, it's going to be uh, the way closer to what was originally built in 1905. The Minnesota's Capitol, when we reopen in, in 2017, it's going to be a, a working state capitol building. It'll still be the seat of state government, and. Uh, so you'll have the House and Senate chambers, you'll have the Supreme Court chambers. So many of the historic spaces that the public is used to seeing will remain the same. But in addition, there's going to be significant improvements for the public. There's going to be a, a new public events space uh, that's reservable uh, for when folks have their day on the hill or other events that will be reservable by the public. There's additional seating capacity uh, off the, the Rathskell or the dining area. Um, there's also, during those late night sessions, there's going to be a, additional, uh, all that's been, food services happened out in the public corridors, and there's now going to be a room uh, with some seating uh, that that can happen going to those late nights. So you're going to, top to bottom, the uh, restrooms are going to be uh, significantly improved in the, in the building. Uh, uh, technology is going to be improved, uh, uh, being able to get cell phone service. Uh, coverage throughout the building. All those things are, are going to be uh, improvements that the public sees when the, when the building reopens. But it did take leadership. It took leadership uh, uh, from both the majority and minority parties as well as from the governor. In the first commission meeting that was held in the fall of 2011, uh, the governor uh, set the direction and the tone. Um, he uh, absolutely understood the need for comprehensive restoration. He understood that the, the building was deteriorating and, and it was at a tipping point. Um, and he really just uh, uh, implored everybody to uh, take one of the most difficult votes of their careers to basically kick them out, themselves out of the Capitol building uh, to facilitate the restoration of the project over a three, four year time period wasn't about short-term fixes, this was about taking a comprehensive approach to uh, the restoration of the capital. You know, I've been uh, part of the negotiations uh, with uh, leadership and it really what I think the starting point was that all the elected officials understood that what we were talking about was uh, not so much about them and, and their time in the office, but it really is going to be how the building's going to function for the next hundred years. So really, uh, 
you know, the, the history of the Capitol is intertwined with those early histories of the Capitol buildings because, you know, if you didn't have one that burned down and one that wasn't quite adequate enough, um, who's to say what might have been the outcome of a new Capitol building? I think anyone who drives by, you know, they see the quadriga, they see the beautiful white marble in the dome, and I think that's uh, hard not to be impressed when you see that, you know, edifice, that magnificent building on that hill.